one man with one microphone and one awesome podcast. Welcome to the Trailer Music Composers Podcast. Hey guys, welcome to another session of the Trailer Music Composers Podcast. I just wanted to uh, just say this first. I've had a cold this week, so my voice is a bit rough. You know, so you may have heard it on one of the other episodes. I kind of forget which episode I'm releasing next. So I've I've done a few this week and my voice has progressively got uh, more and more, you know, like this. So anyway, thank you so much for taking your time to listen to the podcast. You haven't listened to it yet, but I just wanted to tell you that this one, I'm actually really, really excited about this one because this guest has been so integral to my external trailer music career and what i mean by that is i mean not my me as a composer but me as an educator he was one of the first students to buy my course one of four in fact he didn't buy it he pre-purchased it i messaged him because i know him through my wife's cousin i messaged him saying hey uh i want to do this course would you mind giving me some money paying for it uh, so that I can take the time to produce it. And him and three other chaps, they uh, <clears throat> they paid me the money to do the course. And it's as a result of him believing in me at the start, which has meant that I made the first training music course. I then made a hybrid training music course. course I did the, tr- the piano training music courses uh, and then launched the trailer music school. And then from the trailer music school, I launched this podcast and then from this podcast and through other processes, we launched Protégé. That's we, me and Vic launched Protégé and Blue Pearl. So the seed that Dave planted early in my career by believing in me doing the trailer music school and the trailer music course was huge. It was really huge. Um, So it's a real honor for me to have Dave on the podcast. He's such a super nice guy and such an amazing, amazing writer and composer and producer. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this episode. I hope you get a lot out of it. Dave does add some really great tips, um, especially about focus. Enjoy. Dave Carr, welcome to the Trailer Music Composers podcast. Lovely to have you here, sir. Thank you very much. Lovely to be here. <laughs> yeah. So for the listeners uh, uh, that don't know, well, actually, I'm sure everyone doesn't know this, but uh, Dave and I have a connection in real life. Uh, Dave is good friends with my wife's cousin, Joe. Uh, in fact, that's how we initially connected many years ago. Is that right? Yeah, exactly that. You know, in a pub. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so um, Dave, just to ease us in gently, I want you to answer one simple question. If you were an instrument, what would you be and why? Right, right. I, I, should, say, I should say musical instrument, just in case you said musical. microscope. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I've heard you ask this before, so I suppose I'm slightly prepared. Uh, I've spent most of my life being told I'm super laid back, even from a young age. So I think I'd go for something like a jazz-style double bass nice mm. oh see the preparation does help doesn't it <laughs> i was trying to think of other instruments which are laid back but i was drawing blanks to be honest yeah i suppose maybe you know a lot of bass instruments you know slower pace to life you know yeah 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 i like that jazz bass nice yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> right okay so uh dave why don't you introduce yourself to the audience uh you know tell us who you are where you are now and how you got there okay uh i'm dave i was born in london um lived there for about six years then moved over to reading i guess my my musical journey sort of started because my family is i mean a lot of musicians in my family not necessarily super accomplished musicians or anything like that but lots of players my mum was a music teacher and a piano teacher so but right from the beginning really i've had my hands on the on the keys i had a piano in the house at all times sort of thing um i you know piano was the first for me i suppose when i was living in london and then as i moved across to reading 
as I got older, I, I suppose I became aware of what else there is. I mean, my mum was a, she's a singer and a, a trumpet player and a pianist. She kind of encouraged me into trying trumpet, sort of interested, didn't feel like the coolest instrument or something when I was, <laughs> I can't think how old, eight years old or something like that. Um, so I think I dropped that pretty quick. Had piano lessons while I was living in Reading, um, sort of on the approach to secondary school, I suppose. Um, when I got into secondary school, I had my mind absolutely blown by watching these guys play the drums through the music block window. It's like, I feel like a lot changed me in that moment. So then I began, uh, began my love affair with drums. Um, started drum lessons in school. Got a kit, really pissed my neighbours off many times, I think. <laughs> Luckily for me, my dad on his 40th birthday decided he was going to try and learn the drums. This was before I'd, I'd discovered that. Uh, and he basically never did. So there was a drum kit sat in the corner of, well, it was actually my room because there was a bit of spare space in the corner of the room. So either way. Off, well, off I went on my journey of the drums, which was just awesome. Played in a few bands in school. Um, obsessed, just totally obsessed, basically. Nice. After that, I suppose, um, well, through drums, I, you know, it started with like rock music, very quickly transitioned into metal. I think my older sister was into loads of music, or she was really into finding music always going and buying the newest album as it came out sort of thing. So that was really useful to me and metal just pushed the boundary, you know. Um, and which, I suppose which, was which metal of, band specifically? Oh, blimey. Um, heavy bands, like really heavy bands, like Slipknot. Um, bands like The Faceless, it was a super heavy band. Again, it's like pushing the boundaries. So I also like bands like Annihilator, stuff with a bit more groove, Machine Head, loved loads of local music. I mean, I doubt this is going to mean anything to anyone, but I love bands like Silosis. Um, Josh Middleton. Josh Middleton, yeah. Who, um, I had the same guitar teacher as. <laughs> oh, Nick Hollings. I know Nick Hollings as well. <laughs> Nick, Nick Hollings, yeah. there we go. Shout out uh, to Nick. Thank you, sir. Shout out to Nick, yeah. Uh, by Atrophy, uh, um Part of a coward, like, yeah, all, all sorts of stuff. I, I think it kind of like it changed as time went on, really. Um, so that was that was great, but in the end, or as I started to get older, I, you know, it wasn't just the drums that I loved in this music. It was pushing the boundaries on a more of a melodic side as well. And um, so I decided, because my dad's a guitarist, so I decided, and I'd always sort of messed around with the guitar. So I decided this is how I'm going to get my fix, my melodic fix, because you know, rather than smashing it out on the drums, not losing my passion there. So I played guitar for a while while I was still in school. Um, that sort of carried on through college. In fact, no, it did, did carry on through college, but then kind of disappeared again as I went into university. Um, and when I came into university, I rediscovered my love for the piano, which um, I'd always, I didn't stop playing really, but compared to the drums and the guitar for the, all the music I was listening to, it just wasn't quite there, if you know what I mean. Um, I did popular music and record production in Southampton uh, at university, so there was, it was basically focused on production, mixing, recording techniques, stuff like that, which was great, really, really good. And um, learning Pro Tools, that was one of the main things. Um, I think for my time through uni, I started to find my real love for film music. And being back into the piano from when I started university, I. I think my mind started to realize that maybe I could make music like that, but I didn't really know where I was going to go with that. 
I suppose rewinding a bit back when I was in college, my dad worked in a school in London and he was good friends with the music department there in the school. Managed to get a copy of Cubase, what was it called? Cubase SX, I think. And a, really, and a really dodgy computer. Got me an interface from them as well and a mixing desk. Wow. Um, so, you know, me and my mates would do our best to record whatever we could, really. Didn't really know what I was doing, but it was going from the instrument into the machine. So something was happening. Um, so, yeah, I was kind of, I'd already had a little bit of experience in recording. And I suppose that's where the love of film music and the recording aspect started to come together in my mind. And I realized how do people go about this? Um, so towards my, the end of my time in uni, I started to find out what sample libraries were, sort of. I feel like it took me forever to actually understand what was going on. <laughs> I, uh, I, I torrented or cracked a bunch of stuff, which ended up killing my PC in the end pretty much. And yeah, it was, it was a shambles really. But um, coming out of university, I had more of an idea where I wanted to go or at least some idea. Um, the other idea was to work in post-production, audio post-production, because again, I love movie, or I love film and film music, but I also could recognize the, the power of the sound design and stuff like that. So that was definitely interesting to me. I tried, um, I tried pushing that for a little while when I was fresh out of uni, did a few, uh, uh, sort of trial running shifts and stuff for some post houses in London. Um, uh, quickly realized that's not exactly what I wanted, really. I'd already started. Um, I'm not sure if I'd uh, spoken to you at this point, um, but I'd already started trying to make my own film sounding music because I didn't really know where I was supposed to be going with it. Um, at this point, I was using Pro Tools, which I'd learned in uni. Um, I was sort of getting somewhere, but then... Um, just when, you say, went, when you say getting somewhere, what do you mean? I, I don't really know. As in, I was writing music, which was orchestral instruments. It sounded fairly filmy to me. Um, but that's about where it ended, really. Um, I didn't really realise the the potential of being able to, you know, get it out there, sell it, get it on shows and stuff like that. Um, I did meet a guy briefly who lived in not, not too far from where I was then, actually not too far from where you are now. He's a guy, a composer, and I, I contacted him just to simply go and talk to him. He'd, uh, he's the guy who, I can't remember his name, I'm bad about that. He'd written written all the music for um, Thomas Tank Engine, all of it since the beginning of time. Amazing. <laughs> yeah. um, there's, there's yeah, actually, go sorry, on, sorry. I was going to say, there's actually like a huge bed of old school composers and songwriters around us. Uh, oh, really? Yeah, like 60s pop makers, basically. Yeah, yeah. He had, a, it, he had a lovely house and a really cool studio in the back garden. Uh, and he showed me what was what and all the sample libraries he had at the time that really helped push me through and actually realize what was sort of what, what can be done and how a composer sort of goes about things day to day also. Well, yeah. So you've just, you've just uh, started piecing together some, some of your own stuff, orchestral stuff. Oh, actually, uh, just as a side note, uh, those people listening, uh, I still have my rough voice as you've already probably already guessed, still got the cold. Okay. Right. Uh, anyway, Back into it. Um, yeah, so you were just piecing together your own music. You started reaching out to people. Uh, so you reached out to me about maybe 2014. I think that was yeah, when you reached so, out yeah. to me. Uh, so, yeah, it might have been around the same time. Uh, and you reached out to the the guy. I'm sure somebody in the audience knows who the, who, the name of the man who wrote the music to Thomas the Tank Engine. Yeah. What's a legend? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
uh, I think it was pretty soon after that that I was just in Reading at the pub with Joe, who you're related to. And uh, I was, he was just asking me about how things are going. And I was telling him how I was trying to find my way with music and trying to hoping maybe I can turn it into something where I can make some money. And he mentioned you. And it sounded exactly like what I was sort of looking for. So I was like, right, what's his name? Give me his Facebook deets. <laughs> uh, and I got onto you and, uh, yeah, my mind really started to open up after that. He gave me a lot of really, really good advice. Well. Which then later on led to you offering me um, the opportunity to get on, try one of your courses. I didn't know what training was at all, so I didn't really know what I was being asked. Um, but yeah, I went for it, and it was quite mind blowing, to be honest. I just want to uh, put a, put another footnote in here, Dave. Uh, those people listening, you have Dave to thank for all of my courses, basically. Dave and three other composers paid me like a, a little fee to basically produce the course the trailer music course, the original one, because I'd read all about these marketers that said, you know, get people to pre-buy before you do it so you're at least being paid for your time. So I thought, well, who would buy a course on trailer music? And I sort of thought, oh, okay, these these guys have contacted me saying they want to get into, you know, writing music for a living. And I and Dave was one of them. You're one of them, Dave. And, and I said, hey, look, I, I'm really interested in doing this course. I think it would really help you. It, obviously, it would have helped me too. Um, are you interested? And obviously, Dave said yes, and three other guys said yes. And because you paid me and the other chaps paid me this tiny, I don't, I don't know what it was at the time, but uh, you paid me some money and I thought, great, I'm going to produce this course. And so, yeah, you started the training music school, Dave. <laughs> yeah, that's what I mean. It, it felt like a complete course to me. It was, it was perfect. I just It blew my mind. I thought I could use Pro Tools quite well at the time. I know the course wasn't taught in Pro Tools, but just the way that you work, uh, creating templates, colouring, um, it just, I, I, I mean, there's so much I could say about how much it did for me at the time. Just I, you know, I'm not going to stop you from continuing. <laughs> <laughs> Oh no, that's that's really honestly, Dave. That's really good to hear because uh, you know I I do love to hear that actually the stuff I'm producing is helpful, and I do like to hear that I am being helpful and of service because you know I, whether I don't know whether you know, but a, a lot of my reasoning for doing this stuff is because when I first started out, I didn't have anyone to reach out to, and people I did I did find some composers to reach out to, but they were sort of established BBC composers who obviously were too busy to respond to uh, a university student saying, hello, I've just got a ripped copy of, uh, oh, what's that? Uh, Reason. That was it. I was working on Reason back then. I've got a ripped copy of Reason. I want to be a film composer like you. Can you give me some advice? And I, only, only one or two perhaps replied and it was very much just like, yeah, just keep doing it. <laughs> oh, man. <clears throat> so... Sorry, go on. So that's the reason for a lot of this is so that I can give back to composers who want to, to find their footing. Well, it, it just feels luck, uh, lucky to me, really, that you offered me that, to be honest. Especially you saying that, how, you know, you didn't have anyone to offer you the key when you were <laughs> doing it. That's literally what I felt like I was given. Well, you know what? That's lovely to hear. Um, and it was, re it was really interesting because... I was absolutely petrified doing that course, that first course. You know, I didn't want to show my face. You know, I really, you know, it was, it's, it's a, for any composers out there who've ever done walkthroughs, it's a very bizarre thing to be writing and talking about what you're doing at the same time. You know, I think I started to go into a strange little world of like euphemisms. I think I made so many euphemisms in that course. It was probably outrageous. <laughs> well, you sounded very professional to me. Thank you, thank you. I obviously, uh, yeah, that's putting on my my professional voice. Uh, <laughs> okay, so take us from there. From there, what yes. was the next? What were the next steps? So you've just you've just done my first training music course. At that point, I'd not released it to anybody. It was just you four. So, um, that 
but like I said, it really opened up my mind. So as part of the course, it was sort of like, uh, make this track, finish it. And then, you know, that was sort of the objective of the course, wasn't it? So I then went on and just continued to do that after the course. Keep making your making because, first of all, that's what you said in the course. The more you write, the, the better you're going to be, which is absolutely true. I know that now. Um, so I just kept doing that. I had a little bit of um, library work stuff, which obviously was very different to the trailer music, but it it kept me writing and it kept me thinking in a little bit of a different way to the trailer music, I suppose. Um, halfway through, was it halfway through or the end of the course, I was offered an independent film from um, a team of filmmakers in Henley. It was called Portalis, sort of a post-apocalyptic, thrillery type thing, which was really cool. They were like, oh, you know, you write music. Do you want to come and uh, write us some music for this? It's like, yes, I'm not going to say no to that. Turns out it was the music, it was recording, overdubbing all the dialogue, and it was all the sound design, the whole thing as well. Wow. Not paid, you know. I didn't really expect to be paid because, you know, but uh, it was a hell of a lot of work. But I also learned a lot from that. Um, but I also learned from that, that's not what I wanted to do. <laughs> yeah. um, so just carried on writing trailer music. Really, as a... I didn't. I wasn't really trying to push myself out there and give it to any of it to publishers yet because I didn't really feel I was there as such. So I kept writing, and I was working with some library, some ver various um, libraries just for TV work, which is quite nice because you get a little fee up front, which kept me motivated, I suppose. Um, and then starting to see some royalties that gave me even more motivation um and then i think just about after that i got well i might be skipping forward a bit but then the opportunity to write for the student album through the course or from the course um which was amazing for elephant which was like you know, incredible although it was hybrid trailer music which i hadn't ever done so when I got the brief, I panic listened to everything again and again um, until I just about got my head around it. I mean, percussion wise, I was always pretty OK, I think. But uh, when it comes to the synth stuff, that was pretty intimidating for me. But at the by the end of it, it was it was great, really rewarding and having the all the feedback from Vic and yourself was just invaluable it was really really great so i think i was almost more pleased with that than anything because it's real industry professionals giving you honest feedback so here you are again dave reappearing at some point in my career uh that was the initial formation of protege and blue pearl the the companies that vic and i have started <clears throat> excuse me so so for those of you that is in the audience who don't know what that was, that was at that point I had the trailing music school. I think I had it on Udemy. I think I just had my courses on Udemy then. So I had, had a lot of students who admittedly had paid peanuts for the course. Uh, and obviously I, I was working for Vic and I, Vic and I were talking about it. And I said, why don't we run a competition for the students of my course and see if we can find some new talent, you know, that we, the elephant then can then push through in an album. And he was like, huge. That's amazing. Let's do it. So we sent out this brief to everybody uh, on the list of people who signed up to the course. Dave is one of them. Uh, and it was, uh, okay, here's an industry brief. We want you to, I think it was action sound design, wasn't it? The brief uh, yeah. or hybrid sound design. Uh, produce this track and what you've brought, highlighted there dave was the, the problem with the trailing music course it's it's essentially an orchestral trailing music course so most people who submitted for the brief that vic and i put out gave me and vic orchestral music oh right yeah so they missed the brief uh which is you know common people do that anyway <clears throat> uh but we got you and i think there was 18 other composers on board for the album 
so that was it was from there we were just like well maybe we should turn this into a business because this sound um, this was an amazing process for us as much as it was for you guys you know the the problem we had was the feedback process for a lot of the composers was so long because they weren't yeah. weren't used to working to brief they weren't used to working uh, in this professional way uh, you were stood out as one of the ones who produced the goods pretty much straight away. And whenever we asked for feedback, you gave us the exact changes we requested. <clears throat> and just a little tip for the audience. Sorry, Dave. <laughs> uh, just a little tip for the audience. Dave is kind of embodying what I'm often saying to you guys to do, which is keep talking about your work to people. If he hadn't been talking about it, he wouldn't have spoken to my wife's cousin, Joe, who wouldn't have put him forward to me. If he hadn't have continued pursuing, he wouldn't have emailed me asking advice. And you kind of did that sort of semi-regularly, maybe once a year, you know, checking in. And because he checked in, he was on my mind with the training music stuff, and he then brought the course forward. And so let's jump in as to Dave's positive approach to writing. You've just just finished the album with Elephant Music. So that was the competition album. Um, so what happens now? So you've just done this this album. You've just had this first trailer release to the industry. Uh, I'm trying to think of when that was. That was the big. Was it, the, it was the end of 2019. Was that? Or oh, 18? 19, I think. I think. It, yeah, 19. I think it was. Yeah, just after I moved here. So 19. Yeah. Um. So first of all, once that was released, album artwork and all the rest just felt great awesome it was, it was really cool and uh, all the tracks on the album were really cool as well um after that i kind of just kept pushing the tv uh, library work because there seemed to be plenty of it coming in quite varied stuff from um uh, i don't know uh, stripped stripped back um emotional stuff stripped back sort of um I need to think quite a lot of stuff from Master Chef, to be totally honest, which wasn't sort of the sort of thing I thought I was going to be writing, but it seemed to work quite well for me, so I kept going with that for a bit. Um, and I kept writing library library music for companies, but then at the same time kept writing trailer music for myself, or well, just like I said, to keep it going and keep practicing because really I wanted to be, I wanted to be getting orchestral trailer music out there like I learned from the course because I felt I had foundations in that now and it felt far more comfortable as you know onyx was great but I didn't feel as comfortable quite as I did or I do with uh, the orchestral side of things um so then so I suppose through 2000 to uh, 2020 kept writing the library music and then got a call from you towards the end of the year, I think it was that year, saying I'd had a placement. And that was my mind blown, really. Yes. Get in. <laughs> so that was the placement from Onyx, which was the Elephant Music album. Um, yeah, and that was, well, that was huge for Vic and I because it was just like, it was a, it was a big placement. So uh, will you tell the listeners what the placement was? <clears throat> it was yeah, Gears of War for one of their new DLC sidequesters. And it was, yeah, it blew my mind. It was amazing. I never expected my first placement to be something so big and energetic. It was amazing. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's the wonderful thing is, uh, it's kind of having seen you through the whole process, you know, uh, sort of showing you the ropes to trolley music, you putting in the work, you putting in the time, you being a nice guy to work with, and boom, first big placement. Uh, and I remember that feeling so well you know I, I was surprised how, how fast it happened from the album release to be honest it was it was cool that two of us got it as well because it was a track that i wrote with um frank yeah yeah so that was a, a really that's a, again another really nice story with that track because frank was one of the competition winners but halfway through the album um or at least for, very close to the end of the process of the album being finished he had to go away for quite some time and he was worried that he would miss out on the, on the album being released. So I said, look, don't worry. We'll get another composer to do their job. 
with you. It'll be a collaboration because his, his track needed quite a bit of work. He has some really great sounds in there, really great sounds, but structurally it wasn't quite working. Uh, and I thought, okay, well, who's been smashing it on the, on the on that album? And I was like, well, Dave's been smashing it. I think we asked you to do extra tracks actually as well, didn't we? As well as doing the collaboration. Um, again, and because Dave was just so nice to work with, and I'm going to keep saying this, saying this audience, be really nice to work with. It makes a huge difference. It keeps you front of mind as well. Uh, so yeah, and so that was the track you and Frank wrote together. Yeah, it was it was cool that it worked out that way. And I have to say, taking on someone else's almost written track and being asked to finish it is pretty nice compared to just having to rattle a whole one, a whole new one out. He had some really cool sounds in there, so it was it was quite inspiring, really. Yeah, I so I I do a lot of writing with Kieran Birch. And the process we normally do is I will start the track, act one and act two, and he'll take over. And he says exactly the same thing, that having the bones of the track there, it's almost like you're approaching it as a producer more than a composer, because you're just yeah. like, well, I've got all the elements, now I just need to shape it. Yeah, yeah. That yeah, was great. It was awesome, man. Um, so that was, when was that, 2020? and. So what's, yeah. what's, what's, happen what's happening in your world since then? Um, well, since then, um, like, again, just been continuing writing library music, which is still entertaining me. And <laughs> the royalties are certainly growing, which is feeling really good. Uh, I suppose after that, it would have been then Blue Pearl emerged. Another opportunity given to me by you. <laughs> there um, you go uh yeah you just sort of reached out saying what have you got can you send us some stuff so i just sent various stuff and you you picked out some uh some tracks i wrote for i can't remember the name of the library but it was sort of a little bit magic-y a little bit um mystical i suppose something like that so you said how about writing some trailer music for sort of like this stuff which immediately appealed to me because like I said, what I got from the original course, I wanted to write music like that. And uh, that's the opportunity that I've had through Blue Pearl. And I've just sent over the fourth album now, is it? Fourth, fourth album in that kind of, it's sort of Danny Elfman family adventure type stuff, isn't it? You yeah. Know? yeah. <clears throat> just, I've just, I've loved it. Absolutely loved writing this stuff. Well, the it, thing is, you do it so well. Uh, yeah, it just makes me so happy writing it. And it's, yeah, it's really inspiring writing that sort of stuff, I think. Yeah, I think also it's it's so very important as a composer to be in that, in that area that not only feels comfortable, but also excites you. Yeah. Because the excitement just keeps pushing you to write more and more. And, you know, when you're good at it, the excitement pushes you to get better, you know, and, and then you start to learn new tricks and then you just, it's just fantastic. And, and that's what we can hear. We can hear that actually, although you're a great at sound design, having you sent the other things, you sent me a couple of uh, library tracks that were, they weren't trailing music, but we were like, Oh, well, we can hear that he's going to be able to do this lovely kind of magical family adventure vibe so and we know he's good with massive drums so give us those give us those twinkly celestes with massive drums dave and you've been smashing it uh which has been really nice for us as well so uh thank you sir well thank you for the opportunity yeah <laughs> i loved it the amount that I've, that I've used a celeste a, a million times across all the tracks now <laughs> probably my go-to for these albums i'd say oh yeah uh well the thing is it's it, you start playing it and immediately probably a little bit of thanks to harry potter but immediately you go ah magical worlds well that's exactly it you know i, I try starting a track by loading up the piano and it just doesn't quite hit the same no no it doesn't doesn't at all i know um dude it's it's so nice for me to hear the story because you've been i I want you to know you've been so integral in my continuation because another thing you've done, Dave, is at various points in our communication, you've emailed me 
So after the training music course, you remember me saying, Rich, I just want to say thanks for the course. It was really good. It's taught me this, you know. And even just that little email there, I remember telling my wife going, hey, I just had an email from one of the students, Dave. He just said, you know, that, you know, Joe's, Joe's friend. He's just said that he really enjoyed the course. Maybe I should do more. <laughs> you know, wow. and those and those thank yous are really important. You know, it's uh, it's good to show gratitude. Well, that, that course changed my life. So what can I say? Whoop. Again. Oh, dude. Um, so uh, where am I? I'm just, I'm just going to go back over to my questions here. Uh, now, one of the things that I, I do like to ask is not that I like to go to the darker side of writing music, but I, it's, it's tough being a composer stuck in your own, on your own, not in your own, stuck on your own most of the time. So what do you think are the creative barriers you face as a composer, you know, and, and how do you not battle them, but how do you overcome those creative barriers? I think my issue, whether I'm starting a new track or jumping into one which I've already got on the go, it's, it's an issue of focus. I, f I feel like it, it's, it, it may be there in me and I know that I can probably lay it down, but I also know what it feels like when you're writing a track and there's like fireworks going off in your head, like you just, you just laid something down and then that instantly inspires the next thing and the next thing. I think if that's not happening, it can just slowly drag me down. And I've, I've tried to push through it and I have pushed through it, pushed, pushed through it before. But nowadays I find that if I just walk away and exercise to be honest that's one of the main things that i go to it gives me a really good reset both for my ears and my mind i think maybe sometimes if i i try to jump on the music first thing in the morning sort of wake up go and have, go and make a coffee and then just kind of crack on so i feel like i'm quite alive at that time of day um and if it's not happening then i think the energy that i've already got in me kind of works against me so yeah i need to go and get rid of that energy by either walking or something similar i totally agree uh most of my writing sessions are in the morning so if the kids have gone to school nursery um and i've got a little bit of time to write and i don't normally like to have a long writing session normally sort of two hours tops because as you say these sort of clouds begin to emerge don't they and you do need to clear the fog and uh, yeah, exercising is a great one. Meditating, if you want to do it at that time of day, uh, or just having some food and a nap. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, so say on a good day, you sit down, you've had your coffee, you're smashing out ideas, the fireworks are going. Do you stop at a given time, or do you continue until you get to that point where you lose focus? Uh, no, I, if if it's if it's going well and I'm really feeling it, I will just carry on and keep going. And if I can carry on until, you know, I'm not I'm not one to write until twelve at night or anything like that. I'll probably stop about. Well, I don't know. I, I can go into the evening sometimes, but usually when my girlfriend finishes work, will usually be around the time that I probably stop. Uh, but if it's been going well that day. And I'm feeling excited about it, then waking up the next day, it's no issue, usually. I think the issue comes for me, if I, like when I've been writing these albums, once I get to, once I'm about eight tracks down, the last two can be far harder to get out. I think that's when it gets a bit trickier. Okay. Um, so my, my issue is slightly different to that. My issue is often warming into the album and then once i've warmed once i'm sort of three tracks in bosh the rest just falls into place so i mean how do you get over that do you you know and how do you get over that you've okay you've done eight tracks and are they eight complete tracks or are they are eight sketches um it's a little bit all over the place some of them i might like, finish but i say that lightly as in it's it's got its three acts um, usually the first track that I write, I'll probably go back and tear up quite a bit. 
So it's usually from track two onwards that I'm going to be fairly happy with. Uh, yeah, I was just saying about like once you got to track eight, because you, I kind of gave you two questions at once. Okay. Once you get to track eight and you're getting that point where you're like, okay, I've got two tracks to do. I feel like I've covered all the ground already. What do I do now? How do you get over that? Is it just a case of sitting down and just writing and just doing it? Yeah, pretty much a case of sitting down, trying to get it done. If it doesn't work, quickly go for a walk, come back, see if I can get a bit more done. Um, it just seems to have worked out so far. But like I say, I'll sort of bounce around all of the tracks within the album. And I think that kind of, it keeps me interested, but it also keeps me thinking about the album as a whole. And I think sometimes going back and working on another track can help me get through those last two by giving me a few ideas of how I may have finished it or started it. Nice. Okay, for those of you listening, Dave's dropping some, I don't want to say the word value bombs because it's not, I don't feel that's in my vocabulary, uh, but I, I'm going to have to say because I can't think of anything else. Dave's dropping some value bombs. Uh <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Boom. Uh, no, really useful tips, uh, especially the one, if it's not working, stop, do something else. That That is huge. That kind of gear shift in your mind allows you to kind of process what you've been doing. And the other thing about hopping to other tracks, that can be a downfall because you kind of like magpie your way through your work, don't you? If you just keep chopping and changing, you don't really get anywhere. But if, if you're using it at a point where you're losing focus, you go, okay, I'll go to one that's more successful and I can do the, the fine tuning, the production. Because it's, it's a different mindset for me, you know, writing and producing, but they are like almost two different brains. Uh, and in fact, actually, there's, I'd say there's almost a third, isn't there? There's the orchestrating. There's the it's a kind of tedious thing of loading up your templates where you, and then copying and pasting. <laughs> all of the lines so that all the brass are doing that and all the strings are doing that. So yeah, but really useful tips. Do you find there's any other uh, creative barriers for you or is, or is focus the only one? Um, I think mainly focus, to be honest. I mean, maybe trying to find something a little bit different each time. Maybe I can end up surfing through sounds for a while to kind of try and inspire me to find something a little bit different like with these orchestral fantasy albums maybe something other than a celeste for once but <laughs> no <laughs> so, <laughs> but no i think however i'm however i'm feeling about it at the time i think if i notice a, a drop in my focus that's when i know i'm around the point where i should probably just walk away for a bit reset my ears all my mind yeah yeah good cool um okay so what advice would you give because you're you're kind of in that position you've you've landed your your sort of first big trailer you've been doing library work so you, you've got experience in the field so what experience what advice would you give to composers starting out who may be just discovering trailer music because both you and i have got to that point where you, at some point in our career we went wait what's trailer music I didn't know that was a thing. Yeah, absolutely. And loads of people don't know it's a thing still. Uh, so what advice would you give to those people who've just discovered trailer music? Um, number one, don't expect anyone to know what you're talking about. <laughs> um, <laughs> number two, do a course. Do a course, because that that, that's been the best thing that I've done, for sure. Um, Number three, learn your door well, because then, or your workstation, because then it's not going to hold you back. If you want, you know, if you want to be able to chop something off, chop something up and fade it out here and do this and that, you can just do it rather than then having to learn how to do it on the spot. So say alongside a course, learn how to use the production side as in the, the, the software you're using. Um, Facebook forums are super handy. Lots Any particular? All the time. Uh, the, oh, I can't think what they're called. Tra uh, trailer music discussion group, maybe? 
the trailer music support group the support group. Co- cody stills big group of trailer music composers i think the trailer music yeah he, he's gonna he's gonna be like rich can't believe you can't remember the name of my group but <laughs> I'm part of a few of them, yeah, and they're all really useful because someone will drop a question and everyone's pitching in, including all the big hitters, you know, the the big trailer music guys. And it's, you know, if it's your first day trying to be a trailer music composer, you can straight away have advice from the top people, responding yeah. to people there and there. That's 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 been super handy. Also, it's not just the composers. It's it's the uh, editors in there. It's the consultants. It, they're they're all in there. The supervisors. They are all there watching and reading and listening. So because yeah, yeah. it's it's quite a small community at the moment. Um, it's a it is a global one, but you know, joining those groups really helpful because, as you say, you get some incredible advice. Uh, you know really quickly as well i don't i don't know how these guys do any work the amount of facebook posts they reply to you know <laughs> yeah, yeah great I'm, advice i'm pretty poor when it comes to social media posting and stuff like that but i'm always there to read it okay right dude there's some great great tips so let's go over those again um i can't remember what the first one was damn it don't expect anyone to know what you're talking thank about. you don't expect anyone to know what trailer music is basically uh do a course, join the forums, because that will kind of give you, I would learn your door as well. Yeah. 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 yeah Great I mean, advice. For me, for me, knowing Pro Tools before I started all this stuff really helps. Helps a lot. Yeah, big time. Okay, dude. It's time for the quick fire round. Oh, okay. <laughs> Hello. Okay. Um, I think I know the, I think I know the answer to a couple of these, but so this is all about software. All trailer music school, uh, trailer music people are basically software nerds. Uh, whether it's digital audio workstation nerds, or whether it's sample library nerds, or you know sound effects nerds, they love a bit of what's what's the word? I'm just gonna say nerdiness. That's that's the the, the word just left me. Yeah. Uh, and also, we love to hear what other people other people are using. Uh, I think also because the, for me, it reveals how we're all using exactly the same stuff. In fact, Kieran and Cody and I were talking about that on the podcast last week. Yeah, this is yeah, yeah, it's good. It's it, it, we were we were toying to whether whether we should call it the trailer music banter show, but there was I don't think there was enough banter for it to be called banter show. There was you know mild banter, but uh, okay, right. <clears throat> Dave Carr, what is your DAW of choice? Pro Tools. Your go-to piano library? Alicia Keys. Go to... Str- Sorry. Alicia's Keys. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's it, yeah. Uh, yeah, excuse me, Alicia, can I just... Uh, uh, go to string library? Oh, I would probably say LA scoring strings. I bought the light version so many years ago, but it's just got so much bite to it and it's super dry. I, I just have to say that. The spiccatos yeah. are, are great. They're fantastic, aren't they? The first jazz is good too. Um, okay, brass library. Brass library. I haven't forked out on a brass library yet. I'm using um, the composer cloud. So I suppose I would have to say mm-hmm. Hollywood brass. Well, you are forking out. You're just forking out every month a little bit at a time. Yeah, <laughs> I think that's something that should be fixed soon. To be honest. Yeah, yeah. See, I uh, I use Hollywood Brass as well. I do have another a few other brass libraries, but Hollywood Brass is bitey enough. Okay, all right. Go to synth. Oh wait, no, sorry, I skipped. Go to percussion. Percussion. I'm still rocking Damage One, so I have to go for that. Me too. <laughs> I haven't gone for two yet. No, I know everyone says it's amazing and um, that I should do. I, I, I will do. Uh, I'm still waiting to upgrade my Mac so that my Mac doesn't die out on me when I load up newer libraries. Okay, uh, go to synth. Uh, on this bit. One or two? Two. Uh, right, now your top three effects plugins. Uh, it'd have to be Fab Filter Pro Q3. I'd say that's going to be my most used plugin um 
Valhalla room. And hmm, decapitator, maybe. I was just about to say, Proke 3 is one of the ones that everybody has said. And I was about to say, the only other thing that you haven't said, Dave, is a sound toy. Oh, there you go. <laughs> sound toys. <laughs> Decapitator. There we go. <clears throat> okay, right. Now, what is your number one piece of advice to write better trailer music? To write better trailer music, write lots of it. Not, not necessarily write lots that you're going to be um, trying to get work with. Just write loads and loads and loads, because if you write 10 tracks, the 10th track is definitely going to be better than the first basically nice good advice uh right i think that is uh, the end of the quick fire round dave uh Hi. yeah dude i just want to say thank you for taking your time to chat today it's been a long time so we've we've tried to arrange beers several times it's kind of pathetic because we before i moved here we literally lived around the corner from each other yeah. um, <clears throat> so i just want to kind of reiterate a couple of things that you know Dave, you're super nice and super talented. And those two as a combination are a very, very powerful duo. Uh, so those of you who are listening, remember that it's not all about how good you are. It's also about how nice you are to work with. Um, yeah, so thank you so much for taking the time, man. I really appreciate it. I hope the audience, I'm sure they will, will get something out of this. Uh, and I wish you all the best in your trailer music endeavours. Thank you so much, Rich. That's right, dude. So there we go. Thank you so much, guys, for listening. I really hope you got something out of that interview. I certainly enjoyed myself, and I think Dave dropped. <laughs> I don't want to say value bombs again. I, I need to. Th I need to have like uh, post-it notes around my room that say words to say instead of value bombs. Dave gave some great tips. That will do tips and tricks you know hacks life hacks thank you so much for listening guys you're absolute legends uh and i will see you in the next episode well you won't i won't see you i'll, I'll speak to you and you'll hear thanks chaps <laughs>